today. Always a privilege. I appreciate every time that I am allowed to speak. Uh, Brother Whitley isn't here tonight, but even if he was, I would I would tell him thank you. It exhibits a great amount of trust. Uh, you have to trust somebody to let them get behind your pulpit and speak because you you don't want them to say something that you don't feel is biblical or go off on a tangent. So the fact that he allows me to speak is evidence of his trust in me, and I am very thankful for that. Um, before we get started tonight... You know, you usually get the little announcement spiel whenever I get up here because I've got the bully pulpit. I've got the mic and you don't, so <laughs> I get to talk. Uh, coming up this month, at the end of this month, uh, July 31st through August 2nd will be our super summer send-off. It's our back-to-school series of meetings for kids. We're going to have a wonderful time. The kids are going to have a blast. I think that's going to be a given. It, that's, kids can have fun with just about anything. But what I would beg from you, what I would implore from you, is that y'all would support us with prayer. Because this is more than just a rah-rah meeting for our kids to have fun. Our children's ministry is not babysitting your children. That is not their purpose. Our Sunday school is not a place for you to park your kids for an hour so you can get a non-interrupted class time. We have teachers that are dedicated to teaching your children about God. And it's the same thing as with this super summer send-off. Yeah, we're going to have fun. It's going to be a blast. We're going to do some crazy stuff. We always do. We always have fun. But please, I would implore, I would beg, please pray for us. Because more important than the fun and more important than the good time is that Jesus is there with us. Okay? Now, I'm looking out on this audience, and several of you have kids that will be in that. And I know you'll be praying for us. But there's a number of people here who don't have kids that will be there. Please, please, I beg you, please pray for us anyway. We need your prayer. You may not have kids, you may not have grandkids, but my children need your prayer. And the children of the people in this audience need your prayer. We need you to gather together with us, to get behind us and pray for us. I haven't thought about, you know, let's go real crazy, you know, and see if people would fast with us for this thing. I have to talk to my wife about that, I'm not sure. <laughs> But I would, please, please, please pray for us. We want God to move. That's always been my goal. I don't measure things by how much fun people have. I measure things by, did God move? And I want him to move. I want to be a part of that. So even if you don't have kids, pray. All right. You have your Bibles with you tonight. You can open them up to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22. Or if you have your phone, you can, you know, get on that and go to 1 Samuel 22. I'm not going to have the scriptures up there, so if you don't have a Bible or a Bible on your phone, you're out of luck. Write them down, look them up later, and make sure I'm telling you the truth. But I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> don't take my word for it. All right, 1 Samuel 22, starting with verse 1. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Then David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please... Let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. So he brought them before the king of Moab. 
And they dwelt with him all at that time that David was in the stronghold, in that cave. And uh, tonight I was just going to speak to you for a few moments on developed or developing in the dark. Can we pray? Is that all right? Lord Jesus, please be with us here tonight. I know what I'm trying to get across, Lord God. Please uh, make up for my lack, Lord Jesus. Uh, your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, Lord God. And if there's, any, if, 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 if there's any fault tonight, it's with me and not you. So I ask you, Lord God, to, to help me to speak and to get across what I'm feeling and what you want expressed. Help us to receive and to be willing to, to learn from what we're about to talk about. In Jesus' name, amen. This was a dark time in David's life. He was running from Saul, and he finds himself in a dark place. He hides in a cave. I don't know if any of you have gone on the cave explorations, but a lot of times they'll take you down there, and uh, once you get all as far in the cave as you can get, they'll turn off the lights, and you'll experience what total darkness really means. So David is in a dark, dark place. There is a, a, uh, a feature, a, a, a function that is rapidly being taken out of, uh, of uh, technology, but it used to be a, a major part of it, and that's what's called the dark room. Photography's only been around for a couple of hundred years, which is actually a really short time when you stop and you think about the length of human history. And in that time, it's made massive strides. I mean, early cameras were huge. You, you needed a couple men to set them up. They had to have a tripod. Nobody could hold a camera in their hands. And, and then, you know, not only were they huge, but the act of taking a picture took a painfully long time, which is why in the old pictures, nobody ever smiled because <laughs> they were tired of sitting there for an hour. <laughs> they wanted to get up and move. But amazingly, today, we have powerful cameras that are a necessity, not as a camera, but in our phone. Everybody has a camera. They've had, they've had to make laws now because where once you could see a person actually carrying a physical piece of equipment, now everybody has a phone. So is that guy holding up his phone or is he videotaping me? And we have more capability in our phones than they had in the early cameras. But before digital cameras came out and have virtually eliminated the dark room, they had, to, they had to go into a room and they had chemicals and, and they would take those negatives and they would expose them in the chemicals. And with black and white pictures, the chemicals were not sensitive to red or amber light. So a lot of times they'd have a red light in the dark room. They'd have a little bit of light to see by. But with color pictures, they actually needed total darkness because those chemicals were sensitive to everything. And they would be in there for as long as it took for those pictures to come out. They would be in absolute darkness. And even though the digital camera is driving out the dark room, you'll still find one in most major universities. Somebody somewhere, or even professional photographers, there are people who still have a dark room. And it's where they go, and there they, they produce uh, pictures that in some cases have great value and merit, but they're produced in an almost total darkness. I think if any ancient man would understand that process, it would be David. David was a man who understood disappointment. I was thinking about that the other day. Out of any character in the Bible, David knew what it was like to suffer continual disappointment. Well, what do you mean, Brother Tim? In 1 Samuel chapter 16, the family gathered together to eat with the prophet, the, the leader, the, the famous man of God, Samuel. And it turned out that David wasn't even invited. Some of you may say, well, he was out tending the sheep. But if you go on to chapter 17, you find out that they had servants that they could trust the sheep to. 
So why wasn't David invited to the dinner? I don't know if I can, you know, I'm not going to stand on this and say this is absolutely 100% true, but I suspect that there was some family difficulty in David's life. All the brothers were gathered except David. One of them might be king except David. So his life probably wasn't what we consider a, uh, a good family life. In chapter 16, at the end of chapter 16, after he is anointed, he gets a call from the court of King Saul. They say the king, the spirit of the Lord has departed from him. There's a, a spirit of oppression on him. We want David to come play his harp. And I can imagine the thoughts going through David's head. It's it's already happening. I was anointed by Samuel, and here I am. I've gotten the call to go play for the king. I'm going to be in the court of the king. This is the start. This is the beginning. You know, everything that God promised is going to come to pass. But do you know where he is in chapter 17? He's back tending the sheep. Like I said, go and verify it. 16, he's in the court of the king playing for him. 17, he's back in the fields watching his father's sheep. What happened? Here he was. He thought, I'm sure he thought this is the moment. This is, I'm seeing movement. I'm seeing God's promises come to pass. I'm seeing things begin to happen. I'm seeing God move and God bless. And then I'm right back to where I started. <laughs> Here I am. I started as a shepherd. I thought I saw what God was doing. But here I am. Back again. Chapter 17, a certain giant enters the picture. And David is on the battlefield and he's trying. If you read it, he's not saying, I'm the one that's going to take what he's trying to do. He's trying to get somebody to step up. He knows he's not in that army. He, he knows it's not his duty. He's trying to get somebody to step up. And you would think that his own family would be the ones that would back him up. Wouldn't you think that your family would believe in you? Wouldn't you think that they would be the ones saying, you can do it, David? You go, David. David. You tell them all. But in 1 Samuel 17, 28, it says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. He goes and he's doing something. He's doing something for God. He's standing up for God. And his brother tries to slap him down. I know, you, you're, you know, you're just pretending to be following what God's command. You're just pretending to be somebody important. You're just, you just, you know, David, you need to go home and go back to being a shepherd. But in spite of that, he walks out on the battlefield and he slays a giant. When nobody else would take the responsibility, David took it. And God used him to kill the giant. The Philistines run. The army cheers. Everyone's excited. He goes home to the sound of, of women singing his praises. It's happening again. I'm going back to the court of King Saul. Going back to the king says, I've been anointed to be king, and I'm finally, I'm going back. I now, now I have a military victory behind me. Now God's really going to bring it to pass. Now God's really going to start the whole process, the whole journey. He's made friends with the son of King Saul. But by the end of chapter 18, Saul's trying to kill him. And he finds himself on the run. Over 
and over and over again, David achieves heights only to have the rug pulled out from underneath him. <laughs> What's happening? Why is God doing this? Why is God allowing this to happen to him? He's God's chosen man. Why isn't he smoothing the path? Why isn't he just, you know, making all the dominoes fall in the right order? Why isn't he just clearing the way for his servant? And the answer is he's developing him in the darkness. He's allowing David to go through some things. He's, he's shaping David to be the tool that he needs David to be. I'm not going to, I could go on and just, just go through all the things that happened in David's life. I'm not going to for the sake of time, but ups and downs. He knew disappointment. What was God doing? He was shaping him. He was developing him. Turning him into the tool that he could use. James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. He says, hey, be happy that troubles are happening. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James says, if you don't want to lack anything, go through some trials. Be developed in some darkness. See, uh, we want to have the healing without the sickness. You know, we want to have the victory without the battle. We want to have the harvest without the plowing, the planting, the weeding, and the actual getting out there and harvesting. We want to wake up. I don't remember where it was, but I, one time I saw the story of Noah somewhere and God told Noah, build an ark. And I remember this very clearly because I thought it was really strange, but Noah woke up the next day and the ark was already built. God had done it for him in the middle of the night. <laughs> it's not how God works. He gives us a task and he wants us to do it and he develops us in the dark. This is a very familiar passage of scripture, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. What's that mean? It means that God is developing you in your darkness. He didn't say that all things are good. See, a lot of people make that mistake. I'm not here to say that the bad things that are happening to you are good. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is what God's going to do, he's going to take them and he's going to turn them around and use them for his glory. He's going to use those things that have gone wrong. He's going to use those disappointments, those trials, those struggles, and he's going to shape you into the tool that he needs you to be. My wife knows a lot about forgiveness she does um, I possibly would say that my mother-in-law knows more but you see my wife knows about forgiveness but she paid a price for that knowledge it didn't come free she didn't just wake up one morning and God say you now know how to forgive no uh, most of you know the story I'm not going to go through it, but, you know, in order to earn that knowledge, her sister was murdered and her mother was shot. She went through 20 years of fear and mistrust and depression until she learned to forgive. Were those things good? No, but God developed her in the darkness. God molded her into what he needed her to be. Now when she talks about forgiveness, I trust her because she knows what she's talking about. So I, first thing, there's one thing I want you to grasp is that if you're in darkness, if you're in trials, if you're in struggles, if you're in tribulation, there is hope. God is going to do something. The end of Job was better than the beginning. But he had to go through a period of trials and tribulations and struggles before he got there. 
what was happening. God was developing him in his darkness. So the first thing I want you to understand tonight is that if you're in darkness, there's hope. It doesn't matter what your darkness is. There is hope. I serve a God that has the answers. I serve a God that gives strength. I serve a God that molds and works and heals, changes people. I, I always get, I always get uh, kind of irritated. Uh, uh, I was reading an article in the Reader's Digest, and they were complaining about Alcoholics Anonymous. They were saying it was too religious. And I've never considered Alcoholics Anonymous religious. Because they get up every single time and they say, hello, I'm an alcoholic and I'm always going to be an alcoholic. That's not according to Scripture. The Bible says that we're a new creation. That he can set us free. So hold on. In the middle of the darkness. But let's look at some things, that, two things that David did when he was in his darkness. It's not fair. I, I, you know, I already preached about this one time. You know, we, we think we're at the end of our rope, and we say, God, no more, and that's when he piles on more. So here's David. He's running away. He's in a cave. And God brings people to him. God brings him the cream of Israel. <laughs> no. First of all, God brings him his family. Probably because they suspected Saul was going to get them if they didn't go. This is the same family that didn't invite him to dinner. This is the same family where his brother called him all sorts of names and told him to go home. But who comes to him in the cave but his family? Then he starts attracting other people. He gets everyone that's in distress. They've got problems. They've got issues. They got struggles. Let's go see David. Don't you understand? David's already, he's got his own struggles. His own, he's already in a cave. He doesn't need everybody else's problems too. But that's who's coming to see him. He's got everybody who's in debt. And everyone who is discontented. So he's got a bunch of ungrateful losers in the cave with him. That's a recipe to make your day better, isn't it? <laughs> to have a bunch of complainers around you. I'm in a cave, and then all, all the 400, well, yeah, David, we're all in a cave. It's awful, man. It's, oh, it's, this is a bad thing. David could have pitched himself a massive pity party, and he would have had 400 people to sing the chorus with him. But there was something within David the Bible does not go into detail, but those men in debt, those discontented men, those men in distress, David poured into those men, and they became the mighty men, the core that would put him on the throne and keep him there. What happened? David, in the middle of his darkness, started looking outside of himself. He said, yeah, I'm in my darkness and I got problems, but so do these guys, and I'm going to help them out. He, started, he went back to being a shepherd in a cave, only now we're not shepherding sheep, now we're shepherding men. And all the lessons that he's learned to this point, he now pours into these men. And these men grow until they are the core that put him on the throne. He also, he took care of his family, that family that I'm not sure liked him very much. He made sure that they were taken care of. But he looked outside of himself. He didn't go in the cave and suck his thumb. He didn't go in the cave and say, poor David. He got out and he went to work. Now, this is not the first time that I have said this. And please, I'm not asking, I'm not saying this, this is the situation now. But I've struggled with depression. And I have learned that one of the fastest ways to get out of that darkness is for me to serve. What do you mean? I can go in 
feeling lower than the low. But I can go into serving at a meal. Hey, do you need some water? Hey, do you have enough, do you have enough food? And when I begin to look outside of myself and serve other people, something happens. God comes behind me. And that strength that I lacked, he supplies. Why? Because I'm worthy of it? No, but because I'm doing what he wants me to do. (laughs) Most of the time when I'm in depression, when I throw the pity party, that's why I'm there. But if I stop and help other people, he takes care of the problem. So if you're in darkness, start looking for a place to serve. Start looking for somebody to help. Don't go into it with the attitude that I'm going to help this person and everything's going to get better. Because I can't promise you that. I I cannot promise you that. Because there are people that will use you. Go into it, I'm going to help them regardless of what happens to me. The Bible says lend with no expectation of return. Give not expecting to get anything back. And when we can master that, often we get back more, not money, but more than what we gave. And the second thing that David could do that brought him out of his darkness, the first thing was he served, he worked, he discipled, he got out of himself, he looked at others. Is that when he was in those situations, he praised, he worshiped. I I could give you example after example in David's life. The one that stands out to me most, and I've used it before, and I'll probably continue to use it till the day I stop preaching, which will be never, so there you go. You're going to hear it probably many times. (laughs) God tells David, your son is going to die. And David reacts like any one of us. He hits his knees, and he says, dear God, no. No. And he begins to pray, and he begins to fast. He takes off his royal robes. He's wearing sackcloth and ashes. He's showing God, I am serious. I am repenting, but please don't allow this child to die. The Bible says that while he was doing this, the son son passed away. And his servants gathered in the back, and they had a conversation. They said, do we tell him? And essentially what they were saying is if we tell him, I mean, look at him. He's he's already in sackcloth and ashes. He's already, he hasn't eaten. If we tell him, he's just, he's going to go over the deep and we're going to have another Saul on our hands. Another king who's, who's, the spirit of the Lord's departed. He's going to be crazy. You know, we can't tell him. But David was smart. He wasn't stupid. He looked, he saw him back there in their little coffee clutch. And he stood up and he said, my son is dead, isn't he? And they told him, yeah. And the Bible says that before he put on new clothes, before he went and ate, he went to the temple and he worshiped. Did he feel like praising God at that moment? I can guarantee you that he did not. But he did it anyway. He was in a dark place, but he knew the God of light, and that was who he's going to worship. Because he understood that even though he, he was in darkness, God is light. That even though things looked bad for him, God was still in control. Your circumstances don't change how great God is. What's going on in your life doesn't change the fact that we serve a great God. And sometimes we got to stop and remember, it's all falling apart all around me. But you know what? You're still God. You still have it all under control. It hasn't spun out of his hands. It hasn't gone out of his control. And when we start praising and we start worshiping, something happens on the inside of us. 
especially when we don't feel like it. When we don't feel like it, we lift a hand. Say, God, you're worthy. I, I preached it here one time and I still firmly believe it. Praise is less for God than it is for us. God loves it when we praise him, but what happens inside of us is so dynamic when we start to praise him. How could David go out and fight a giant? See, everybody else was looking. Like me looking at uh, Brother Spurlock. Well, he's a lot taller than I am. You know, he's bigger. If he's a problem, then I have a problem. He's going to take me out. And they looked at that giant, and they compared the giant to themselves. But David looked at the giant, and because he had an attitude of praise, he compared the giant to God. He said, not so much. We can take him. You get your eyes off your problems, and you get them on the one that solves problems. It'll develop you in your darkness. It'll make you stronger than you ever were before. You know, I already mentioned Job. Do you know what brought him out of his trials? The Bible says that what brought Job out of his trials is when he prayed for his friends. Huh. I'm convinced that the number one cause of sin, that we can sum it all up as one thing, selfishness. I matter more than you do. So we are most like God when we turn and we say, you matter more than I do. What you need is more important than what I want. And that'll bring us out of our darkness. Now listen. Those are some principles. You can listen to them. You can think I did a good job. And if you do, thank you. I appreciate it. By the way, this, not, this idea is not new to me. Kayla was back there telling AJ that this was preached at youth camp. Yeah, you're right. It was. I steal from the best. Excuse me. I plagiarize from the best. <laughs> but it touched me when I was there. And I wanted to pass it on to you. You can hear it. You can think I did a good job. And then you can go home and not practice it. And you know how much good it'll do you? Absolutely none. If you're here for pretty words, I'm not sure I can help you. Uh, I'm not sure I have the skills that you need. But if you're here to learn something, go home and do what I've talked about. I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're going through. But if you're in darkness, go find somebody to help. Go look outside of yourself. If you, if you have questions, I can hook you up. I can show you where the soup kitchens are at. And, and, and I can show you places where you can go and you can help and you can volunteer. But get out of your house and help somebody. Sister Fields, I'm sure, could have a list of stuff that you could do here at the church. Somebody was asking me, and I was going to go talk to Sister Fields. She's got a better understanding of what's going on. Most, and the other thing you can do is you can praise him. My attitude changes when I praise him. I've noticed when I listen to secular things, when I listen to secular music or if I'm listening, I, okay, I like old time radio. Some of you may not know what that is, but I listen to it. But if I listen to that too much, it changes my outlook. There's a difference in me when I start listening to praise and worship. When I start listening to godly things. It changes my attitude. So get out there. Find somebody to help and praise God. Praise looks different on everybody. What might be praise to me may not be praise to you. But you find some way to praise God. You honor him in some way. You lift him up. You do something that you've never done before. 
Maybe sing a song at the top of your lungs regardless of who's listening. <laughs> Maybe take a walk and, and, and point out the beauty. Just talk to God and point out the beauty of the world around you. That's a form of praise. Tell him how much you love him. Go find a place. Go tell somebody about how great he is. God will bring you out of your darkness. He's developing you. He's making you better than you were before. We don't like it, but it's necessary. I, I want to be who God wants me to be. And if I have to go through some pain and suffering to get there, then that's the price I got to pay. But I'm willing to pay. He, you know what? He died for me. <laughs> Our suffering is not worthy to be compared to what he went through. So I'm willing to pay that price for the chance to be who he wants me to be. Can we bow our heads here tonight? Lord God, you see every single person in this place. Uh, there are trials, there are struggles, there are some people here who may be in the darkness even right now. What I am asking you to do right now, Jesus, is begin to show them, give them a glimpse of that hope that you've given to us all. Give them a glimpse, Lord Jesus, that you're going to bring them out. If they need help serving God, then help them to find somebody to help. Help them to find somebody to serve. If they need help praising God, then help them to learn or find a way to praise you and lift you up. But you are going to bring us out of our darkness, and we are going to be stronger than we were when we went in. And you are going to do great things, God, through us. We appreciate you. We love you. We magnify you. We worship you. You are awesome. There is nobody like you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, I'll give, I will dismiss you all here tonight. Brother James has an offering bag there in the back. If you have offering, stop by and see him. Looking forward to see what God can do this Mon uh, Monday. No, not Monday. Sunday, excuse me. Sunday, come, invite several people. Invite the neighborhood. Invite the apartment complex. <laughs> so let's see what God can do. All right, praise God.